Okay, church, we're continuing on now, John chapter 3. And we're picking up where we left off the last time. Uh, Let's go to verse 12. And then we're going to be moving steadily into 13 today. 13 is our main verse we're going to cover. But I just want to sort of refresh. In verse 12, if I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall, ye, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, a ruler of Israel, who should know the scriptures. We've seen as we've gone through John chapter 3 that Jesus keeps taking Nicodemus back to the scriptures. Okay? Today is no exception. Jesus is always teaching from the scriptures. And he's going to... Cover with him in verse 13, if we split verse 13 in half, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, he's going to talk to him from the Old Testament about something earthly, and then he's going to conclude with even the Son of Man, which is, present verb tense, which is in heaven, he's going to take him into something heavenly. Now, can a man know heavenly things? If God does not share, no. The man on earth can only know earthly things. If he wants to know heavenly things, God must open heaven to him. So this is what Jesus is doing at the end of 13 right here. I assure you, by the end of today's teaching, you'll be utterly fascinated uh, because heaven is a curiosity to us all. We're born on earth, but we're born again, heavenly, from above. We covered that in John 3. So our cravings are naturally toward where we're going, not where we are. We're not interested in the things of the world any longer. We have a new craving that's going on in our spirit, man, and it's to look toward where we're going. All right. Jesus is going to take Nicodemus to the scriptures here at verse 13. We're going to recover some of the things we covered last time, but we're going to do it a little later on. You'll see it sort of leak out in today's teaching because we'll want some refreshing on that as we go. But it's not going to be an upfront recover. Um, The first thing we're going to see here is that Jesus is again taking Nicodemus to the scripture. Okay, everything is brought back to the scripture. And remember, what's the shorthand of scripture? No, script. If we take scripture and we shorten it to abbreviate it, remember, God uses abbreviations in his Bible. You're talking about the script. Everything is according to the script. Okay, so Jesus is always taking people to the script. You want to know what's going on in life, in this world. You want to have any idea, you need to go to the script because everything is happening according to the script. So this is where Nicodemus is being taken to the script, the scripture. All right. We can call this, um, there's going to be different points here. This is rabbi school. Remember, Nicodemus is a rabbi. It's called a rabbi in John 3. So a transliteration of the Hebrew rabbi interpreted by the Holy Ghost to mean teacher, okay? So Jesus is taking Nicodemus to rabbi school. This is point one, taking him to rabbi school, point one. Uh, In John 3, 13, this is very important for us to understand what is being stated here. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. This is the part of the text we're going to be working with first right now. Let's go to Psalm 24. This is where Jesus is whisking Nicodemus to. When we read Psalm 24, 
you'll see that he's starting Nicodemus with earthly things. Remember what he had just said to Nicodemus? If you can't understand earthly things, how can you understand heavenly things? That Jesus is both on earth, speaking to Nicodemus, and is, present verb tense, is in heaven. So look at how Psalm 24, 1 starts. This is where the Lord is teaching him from. The earth is the Lord's. The earth. Starts off right there with the earth. It's telling Nicodemus about earthly things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world, which is another word for earth in this case. And transitions from the terra firma earth to the people of earth, earth, world, people, okay? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein, okay? So from earth to world to the people. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place. Remember, it's all about standing. Your Christian walk is all about standing. Oh, I evangelized to a million people. Great, do you know how to stand? That's the question. And I guarantee you, there's more people who can evangelize than can stand. So you see that this ascending, and this is an earthly hill that it's speaking of. He's talking to Nicodemus about earthly things first. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? This is a reference to Jerusalem. Or who shall stand in his holy place? Once he has ascended, once whoever this is in Psalm 24, once whoever this is, has ascended, what does he do? Stands. So what was the goal of his ascending? To stand. Again, guys, going back to yesterday's Bible study, for those of you who were there, you've got to understand how important the goal of standing is. Okay, It is not a small thing to be able to stand. That was yesterday's time together. Okay? So you see in the ascending, this is what he's talking to Nicodemus about, right? No man hath ascended. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Now, what man does this describe? Jesus. He's the only man it could possibly describe is Jesus right here. All scripture is testifying to Jesus. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Real quick, what's vanity? A simple word for vanity. Has the word vain in it, nothing, emptiness, things that are unworthy. Okay? This world, we go back to Ecclesiastes, it's all about vanity, that this world it's all vanity. Two bookings just came in for the museum, by the way, right now. Um, nor sworn deceitfully. Okay? Nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. When Jesus was raised from the dead, what was he declared? Righteous. So this is showing you Jesus' ascension in prophecy, that he alone, as he's talking to Nicodemus, that no man hath ascended, that he would be the only one who would ascend. And hidden in here is his death, because his death, has to come before the Holy Ghost's declaration that he is righteous. You see how things can be hidden in there? In other words, if you go from A to C, B 
was intended for you to perceive because you can't go to C without B. This is how the scriptures work. Now watch this, follow this. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And then it says, this is the generation of them that seek him. Generation. This is inferring to you that after he accomplishes this, genes are coming forth. Generation is coming forth. A line is coming forth. This is the born again ones being prophesied in Israel's Old Testament scriptures. Do you see that? Do you understand why I'm saying that? From generation to generation. So in here, in this ascending, in Psalm 24, it is revealing Jesus as the only pure heart that can ascend. As a man, no man hath ascended. And not only would he ascend, but that a generation would come out of him. Genes, a genealogy would come out. We are all part of the genealogy of Jesus, after Jesus. There's a genealogy of Jesus before Jesus, which is natural. The born again ones are in the genealogy of Jesus after him, supernatural, born again. That's all prophesied right here. I hope you can all see it. If it's difficult to see that, go back and meditate on Psalm 24, because this is what he's revealing to Nicodemus. And what does he talk about primarily in his talk to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? About being born again. So you see how this is explicitly the scripture that he's taking Nicodemus to rabbi school, part one, to understand. Did the Old Testament prophesy that a generation was coming of born again ones? Yes. Is this the only place in the Old Testament? No. Okay. So in 1 through 5, you're seeing in Psalm 24, the ascension of Jesus. And then in verse 6, the reward of the ascension of Jesus, his victory in the issue of generations. That's in verse 6. Now, this means that Jesus is the only one as a man who can himself, by good works, ascend, or by keeping the law, I say good works because that's how most people fuzzy think. According to Galatians 4.4, 4, he was born under the law, which means he kept the law. He's the only one to have a heart capable of doing this, and by his own self-righteousness, be received by God. Now remember, and let's draw it out. Let me get a pen. Oh, I don't, let me use this for a bookmarker, Chase. Remember the law and anyone and grace, anyone who, who is talking like, well, I've never killed anyone. What's your hope of going to heaven? Well, I've been a good person. Well, I've never killed anyone. They're all speaking in this wise law. And they're trying to ascend. So they're down here under the law. And they're trying to ascend to God, to be received, to be approved. But as Jesus is telling Nicodemus, no man hath ascended. Except he takes him to Psalm 24 that's embodied in what he's communicating to Nicodemus. And in Psalm 24, there is a man who ascended, isn't there? Jesus is claiming Psalm 24 for himself. So this person here, no way. Jesus, the only man. This is why it's important that he says, save the son of man, which is from heaven, okay? 
because the word, this is John 1, 1, the word came down and was made flesh. It's John 1, 14. It's very important. And the church has lost touch with understanding the fundamental identity of Jesus as the word of God, that the word was made flesh. Then, as a man hath ascended by his own self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. Now, I've told you that this is a legitimate path. You may, you may stand before God justified by your own self-righteousness if you think you can handle that. Jesus says, no man has done it. Do you know how many billions of people lived before Jesus? What a massive, bold declaration when he says those four words, no man hath ascended, hath ascended. Billions of people making the attempt and he's the only one to succeed. But it is a legitimate opportunity. Don't take it. Okay? Having then ascended, the generations have now come out of him. Now, We're going to be learning a lot about the temple today and what this has to do with what Jesus is sharing. So I'm going to work over here on this side with the figure of the temple. What's outside the temple? Huh? No, what's outside the temple? The outer court's part of the temple. It's the outer court. Nope. Very important you understand this. The world. Remember, this is a this is a temple or tabernacle in the wilderness. The world. World is outside here. Here you have the brazen altar. This will just be a loose sketch. The brazen altar where the sacrifice is made. You have the laver where the priest has to wash. Then you have the holy place and the most holy place. In the holy place, you have the showbread. On the table. Showbread on the table, and you have the candlestick, the golden candlestick. You're going to need to know this for next week as well in part two of this. And here you have the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is at what? Rest. It's at rest. Okay? Yes, altar of incense. Thank you. We also have the altar of incense right here. Okay. Now, remember how we talked last week? Uh, Everything God does is two and one. You have one outside, two inside components. Remember? You can only see the outside component. The other two have to be revealed. So if you just take yourself, you are a body, soul, and spirit. The outside portion is the body. The soul and the spirit are the parts that are the deeper parts, the secret parts. I can observe the outward part, but I cannot know the inward part until the inward part chooses to reveal itself. And everything God does follows this this format. I won't overly go into all of those examples because that was another time when we did that. But we see that here. 
this is all the outward part here. So the one giving the offering could come with the priest and understand and view and have a visible awareness of everything going on. But in here, they were not allowed. Only the priest could come in. The priest would wash and then he could enter in. There was no natural light in here. Only the divine light of the candlestick. That's very important. And then the priest, having special understanding about the hidden part, could not enter here, only save once a year by the blood. And it was just for putting the blood on the mercy seat, and then he had to leave. This is where he would put the incense right here to burn, the smoke of the incense. So you can see you have one outward part and two inward parts, just like you're made with one outward part and a soul and a spirit, two inward parts. This, remember he's talking to Nicodemus about earthly things, and then he's going to transition into what? Heavenly things. This is an earthly thing, a physical copy. Everything spiritual has a physical replication. This is a... Physical representation of the whole Genesis 1-1, heaven and earth paradigm, okay? Heaven and earth. This is the throne of God. This is the third heaven. How many heavens? Three heavens, right? Paul talks about going to the third heaven, right? This is the third heaven here. This is the second heaven here. Man doesn't really go into the second heaven. And there's the first heaven here, and then the earth, the world outside. You understand how that works? Okay. Now, this is important because Satan fell from here as an anointed cherub that covereth. Where was he covering? He was covering here. What's, what's covering the mercy seat. The cherubs are covering the mercy seat. This is where he fell from. He fell to the world, into the world, into the earth. Okay? Now he still has access, but when he experienced his first fall, he has several falls in the scriptures. They keep getting lower and lower until he finally falls, ultimately where? into the lake of fire. That's his last fall. So what you have to understand is, and the reason I'm bringing Satan up right now is because he is trying to ascend. When we go to Isaiah 14, we read all about what is in his heart and that he says he will ascend to the sides of the north. He will ascend to the sides of the north. That is Psalm 24. The north being Jerusalem, the hill of Jerusalem, and the temple. He's saying, I will ascend back up to here on my own. Now, how is he doing that? Attempting to do that? Is he attempting to do it through the law and good works? No, he's not so foolish as that. Only men are self-confident to attempt this. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Only men are that foolish. So how is he trying to do this and get back up through to the holy of holies? Nope. Think of it in terms of scripture. War. He's warring right here in the heavenlies, the second heavens. This is where he currently is in the second heavens warring at the door of the third heaven. Now, what happens when in Revelation 12, Michael and his angels fight Satan, the dragon, and his angels? There's no more place for them found in heaven. And they are going to be cast down to the earth, as it says in Revelation 12. So right now, if you want to take this temple model as a map of what's going on in 
the world, the first heaven, the second heavens, and the third heaven, this will show you where he's positioned right now with his armies. He is in an air force battle. In his air force battle, he's controlling everything under him, but he's not controlling what's above him. He'll lose the air force battle, and then he'll be cast down to the earth where he will move as an army, a ground army operation at that time. That will be hell on earth. This is serious stuff, guys. No man hath ascended. And Satan is not going to ascend either. Okay? Let me see something. All right. So what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is that he, as the great high priest, is the only one without a sacrifice who will enter in because he himself will be the sacrifice. That would be like you saying, I am going to sacrifice myself. And in my sacrifice of myself, I will then raise myself from the dead because my sacrifice will utterly please God of myself and make all atonement, et cetera, et cetera. It's that kind of foolish talk. That's what Jesus was foolishly talking. Not so foolish, huh? So he then is saying that he will ascend the hill to where the temple is, and by his self, in his own self-righteousness, he will pass through all of these right into here to stand. Boom. And take his seat upon the mercy seat, the ark, the throne. This is astounding. Psalm 24 is really loaded. Okay. So in taking Nicodemus to rabbi school, he's first teaching him the scriptures of Psalm 24. Then he's teaching him a picture of the temple and what the temple layout is really all about. It's all about Genesis 1-1, heaven and earth. Heaven, the heavens, and earth. Genesis 1-1. Because those are the two realms, as we learn here, those are the two realms that are in chaos right now. Heaven and earth. Those are the two realms that are going to be reconciled by Christ. Heaven and earth. And each of God's two programs are going to be assigned to their sphere. Israel is going to be assigned to the earth. The church is going to be assigned to heaven, the heavenlies being a supernatural body of born-again ones. Just like it says in Psalm 24, thanks to his ascending under the law, self-righteously ascending, walking in by himself, no need for a high priest because he is the high priest. I am the high priest. No need for a sacrifice. I am the sacrifice. No need for blood. I am the blood. No need for righteousness. I am the righteousness. No need to wash at the laver because I am clean. Remember Psalm 24? Who's going to ascend to that hill? The pure heart, all those things that are listed. Does that kind of a man need a laver to wash before entering into the presence of God? Mm. This is powerful. Now, look at what it says. Let's closely examine and the reason he's he's taking him to psalm 24 he's teaching him scripture at rabbi school part one scripture rabbi school part two i'm sorry the letters the letters at rabbi school part one psalm 24 just teaching him the text of scripture then he's teaching embedded in that the picture of the temple the picture of scripture remember god does everything I'm going to erase this one over here now, okay? This one's going to come down. Y'all got it? God 
God doing everything in pattern. And it's always the two one. You have the letter of scripture. Okay. The letter of scripture would be like Aleph in Hebrew, Aleph. There's your letter. Every letter has a picture. Okay. That would be the ox that it came from. Aleph comes from an ox. It's the picture of an ox. And then it would have a number. And it would be the number one. Okay. This is how Hebrew was. Hebrew was carrying the English. This letter, this is the one part that everyone can see and read and look at. It's like the outer court. Everyone's welcome to it. The picture is something inside the letter. The number is something inside the letter. This is, again, the two-in-one pattern that God operates on. And that's really important because when we come to understand the scriptures today, this attribute of life has constantly gone through the scriptures from the beginning through history as the scriptures have grown and come into their maturity in the King James Bible. So now we, have, we see the same thing. We have letters, pictures. The pictures are all still there. They don't change. And they all have numbers. So when we read in John 3, watch this now. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he, he that came down from heaven. Look at this, guys. Why does it say he that came down from heaven? What is the fundamental understanding of Jesus coming down from heaven in John 1.14? How does God word it? Does God say Jesus was made flesh? Does he say the Son of Man was made flesh? He says the word, the word was made flesh. He came down from heaven to be the son of man, made flesh. The son of man is the product of the word that he made flesh. And what do we have in the King James Bible when it was issued in 1611? We have the 1611 great he Bible. You understand that? Now, Matt, you're new here. You may not understand when the King James Bible was issued in 1611, there's what's called the great he Bible and the great she Bible. The world perceives it as misprints, an S being left off of the word she. The world views it naturally as misprints, but God was actually working pictures and doing things. And so, even according to John 3.13, he came down. Who's he? The word. The word made flesh. The he Bible. The 1611 great he King James Bible. That's where the scriptures were all heading. And Jesus was in step with that prophetic move before their time in the year 1611. Let's, yeah, that's going to confuse the audience on that just because it's, it's, it's beyond our scope, Howard. <laughs> I love it, and, and afterwards we'll get into that. But you understand that, okay? You see that then? How God is able to write the scriptures all the way back then showing you what's coming, this great he, he Bible, made flesh, son of man, to bring man into ascension, okay? The new age and the truth are always very, very similar, okay? God uses numbers. New age has numbers and numerology. God still uses numbers. He's the creator of numbers, okay? If you want to know who created math, his name is Jesus. And likewise, we are ascending, but we are not ascending on our own. No man hath ascended by himself is what this means. In Christ, we are ascending 
into the heavens and into heaven and before the throne of God. Okay. So the new age then having what they call ascended masters are projecting the same kind of concept, very same kind of concept, but they're suggesting it on your own. You can ascend yourself. So we're always going to be dealing with this. We're always going to be dealing with the near lookalike. You want to know the truth? You're going to have to go with the truth. You're going to have to deal with the near lookalike. It's just part of the way it is. All right. Now Jesus is going to take Nicodemus, having taught him a heavenly thing. Psalm 24, the text. That's the outward most part. Then he took him to rabbi school, part two. And in that is conveying all of this truth here about the temple and that Jesus is ascending. And now he's going to take him into something heavenly. And he's going to say something that people who hate the King James Bible hate reading because they want to explain things away. They want to make it a matter of textual criticism. Well, this shouldn't be there, etc., etc. Never, ever, ever change the word of God because you don't understand it period. You will never get anywhere with God. In fact, if you want the door slammed in your face, that's one of the first things you should do is start changing the Bible because you don't understand it. Just say, I don't understand how this could be. I don't understand why it says this here and looks like it says something over here to the contrary. I don't know why it looks like there's a contradiction. Don't ever say there's a contradiction. Okay. God is wiser than you and he's worded his word with plenty opportunities for you to slip and fall if that's what you desire in assessing his character in writing the word of god and how he has done it all right now look at this and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven now what jesus is presenting to nicodemus is that he is both here on earth speaking to him and at the current moment here. Not here in the pattern on earth of the temple, but the reality of the temple in heaven at the throne. Now we obviously cannot duplicate a thought like that in experience ourselves so we cannot easily understand it correct it's something very mysterious to us you got to get used to mystery in the bible the bible itself is utterly mysterious in its construction and i want you to relate in this kind of a way you just pretend for a moment that you are a two-dimensional creation. That means you would live in two dimensions, right? And you would not know what the third dimension was. It's hard to comprehend that, but I'm gonna make it really easy for you to understand that. And it's easy for me to make you understand that because the third, the third dimension has authority over the second dimension. That means I can fully comprehend the second dimension because I have authority over it because I'm in the higher dimension, the third dimension. So if I have a car, let's say, uh, here's a truck. Okay. Well, it don't matter. Just keep trucking. Okay. It's white. Can't you see? <laughs> So look, here you have a truck, and let's just, Electric. For, for reference sake, let's just do north, south, west, east here, just so I can refer to some points. Okay, this is a two-dimensional truck. This truck can never drive in the eastward direction. Think about it. Can someone here tell me how this truck can really drive in the eastward direction? Because the truck, not having a third dimension, cannot turn around, okay? It can't go like this. 
to go in that direction. If it attempts to go in this direction, it has to rotate, you know, like let's say clockwise. And when it does that, it's going to be on its roof. So, it's going to be on its roof. And its tires are just going to spin and spin out. It's not going anywhere. Does that make sense? Total sense, right? Now, explain to this truck the third dimension which is in heaven. This is like Jesus saying to the truck, except the son of man, which is in heaven. Okay. Nicodemus is like this truck. It's like telling the driver of this truck, go east. Can't comprehend how that could even be possible. Well, it's possible thanks to the third dimension. Uh, I suppose it could go in reverse. <laughs> I suppose it could go in reverse. Unless it was Howard's car, because Howard's car didn't have reverse. <laughs> the one back in Texas. Okay, look. Let's go back north, south, west, east. Okay. So now we have a, a, a 3D. I'm going to start all the way. Here's our truck again. Now it's in the third dimension. Okay. So now it can go like this and turn because it has three dimensions to go east right okay now if we say to the truck i want you to turn around to be positioned eastward without rotating without any rotation he would say i can't do that okay then a higher dimension comes along and shows the truck how it does it and so what it does is its back end starts moving this way while its front end starts moving this way. They cross each other at a point and they go in the other direction. Did that make sense? Let me see you do that. You can't do that, can you? you see, this is what Jesus is speaking like to Nicodemus when he's telling Nicodemus, I'm here talking with you and I'm in heaven right now. And people want to say, well, that shouldn't be in the King James Bible because we, we ultimately can't understand what's being said. So it must not supposed to be being said, et cetera, et cetera. But you see how easy that was to understand? So imagine you're standing here and you want to face the other direction. Instead of using three dimensions to turn around, you're standing here and all of a sudden your back end and your front end begin to morph until they've traded places by going through each other, okay? This is strictly to show you that you, you have not even begun to understand what's really going on in heaven and all that God is doing, how he raised the Bible, how he took his eternal word and manifested it in time, and yet people want to be quick to criticize because they're always trying to make a pragmatic understanding of things in their own dimension, with their own mind, with their own strength. And Jesus is showing Nicodemus here something heavenly that requires expansion of realms to accomplish. Amazing, amazing things. Now, this is not the only place in Scripture where this occurs. I'm going to leave you with a couple more. You can search out many more on your own, but I want you to have that understanding there, that you're like that truck, okay? If you're a 2D truck, get a hold of the 3D. If you're a 3D truck, get a hold of whatever dimension I just demonstrated is in, because believe me, it's there. It's there. So, in fact, if we talk about UFOs, a lot of times when they're disappearing, this is what they're doing, is they're here like this, and then they are going like that, and you can see it, and when they cross over at this point here, they become invisible because they've, they've entered to where you can't see it. They're on a one dimension that you can't see. You cannot see, technically, a one dimension. So in crossing over, there's a vanish point here until it emerges, re-emerges like that. Okay. 
So all kinds of things going on. Now look real quick, and we're going to end it with this. Um, let's flip to John 11 real quick, 25. Okay. Now, Jesus in John eleven twenty five. This is at the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said, and just pay attention to the verb tenses, because when he's talking to Nicodemus in John three, it's the verb tense where he's saying is is in heaven. So he's over here talking to Nicodemus. Okay, he's talking to Nicodemus here on earth. And he's saying, I'm here at the same time, the real temple in heaven, the real one, the one that this one you're looking at and that you've been raised all about, Nicodemus, the pattern, I'm in the real one right now while I'm talking to you, is, is. So in John 11, we are at that verse 35, I'm sorry, 11, 25, you'll see heavenly things pop out here again. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus had not died yet at this time to be resurrected, but he's already, according to the same principle of revelation, of divine revelation and heavenly things, according to the reality of heavenly, heavenly things which are and eternal things which are, he is saying before he's crucified and resurrected, I am the resurrection and the life, okay? And you can go through these later. Well, he says I am over and over in John, but the point is that he's speaking of something future that he already possesses, okay? He already possesses the resurrection life before he's been killed. Okay, now in time, we have to be sown into death, then resurrected to have the resurrection life. Except being born again, technically, we already have the resurrection life as a seed within us. So in a, in a real way, we have the same truth that Jesus is sharing here. But that is for another time. I don't want to overly get into this because I want to finish up. Uh, go to Ephesians. And I want you to see how... Paul understood this. Remember, Paul was taken to the third heaven. He had a lot of understanding, guys. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The revelation of Ephesians is that we are while on earth, concurrently, concurrently seated here with Jesus in the place of authority at the throne of the Most High. Okay? So again, which are you? Are you here struggling or are you seated in authority? The answer is both. Okay? Are you here gaining truth? Or are you there seated in authority, which has the word truth in it? Filled. Both. Both. And if you fumble at that thought, you just need to back, go back to this type of an understanding. That there's things that we don't understand, but that doesn't make them not true. It may not be things you can comprehend, but you can certainly apprehend them and gain the power from them without understanding them, simply because it's true. And by believing it, you will draw power. So, hath raised us up. When do the scriptures say we were raised up? 
Scriptures say we were raised up when Jesus was raised from the dead. You say, I wasn't born yet. Obviously. We're not saying you were born yet. Well, we are saying that you were raised when he was raised. Now, can I explain that? Well, I've done my best to give you an explanation. Ultimately, none of us can explain it. It's a matter of faith, truth, hope. Yep. I can assure you that when you believe it, you will become powerful. When you believe it from the heart, because you're walking in the truth. And nothing can be done against the truth. Nothing can be spoken against the truth. Nothing can be done against the truth. When truth has made you solid and your substance is truth, man of truth, you will stand. You will realize that Christ made you to ascend his holy hill. And that in him, you are literally able to stand with all, having done with all, to stand. And you will see a new creature, you, that you never thought could be so. And we're seeing that with this church as we're all journeying on and growing in the Lord. This is powerful, powerful stuff. Imagine how Nicodemus felt. He showed him earthly things. He showed him heavenly things. You've got to start with earthly things. Don't reject the heavenly things. You've got to start with earthly things. Still, heavenly things are going to get thrown at you. Just like with Nicodemus. Jesus didn't pause. Wait for him to get all the earthly things. He brought heavenly things right away. He almost made it unbelievable. As in, I've shared some things with you, and now I'm going to push you over the top. God likes to push us over the top, guys. He does. All right. We are going to, next week when we gather, I want you to memorize this because we have some very powerful sharing on this in the next scripture as we go forward. Amen? So be ready for a journey through the temple with Jesus as he walks right past all of this in self-righteousness. That's powerful because we're, we're constantly, the image in our mind is always bringing the sacrifice and the washing of the priest. He's covered in sweat, smoke, dirt, blood. And he's proxy for everything. Everything's in his hand proxy. Jesus is going to do it all himself. And we're going to see that in a very unique way. I guarantee you've never seen it before. And what you're going to see as he walks right through self-righteously, boom, to stand, present himself. He's presented and he's received, and then he sits down. That's going to be all of us if we're in Christ. Amen.